microphone and video have been disabled. In addition, you will also see the language interpretation icon at the top or bottom of your screen, where you may toggle to the language interpretation icon and select the English channel for English or the Korean channel for the Korean translation. Today, we will be using Pigeonhole for our Q&A session. Please have another internet-enabled device to access Pigeonhole for you to post questions to the speakers during the Q&A. You can also vote on any questions that interest you. You may visit www.pigeonhole.at and key in the passcode NHBICHCAP, or you may scan the QR code shown on the screen here. If you have any questions during the presentations, feel free to submit them. Also, if any questions interest you, you may vote for these questions. Questions with the highest number of votes will stand a better chance to be answered by the speakers. We'll begin today's opening ceremony with a video performance by Nadi Singapura. This will be followed by opening remarks from Dr. Gi Hyung Kim, Director General of ICHCAP Korea, as well as Ms. Chang Hui Ni, CEO of the National Heritage Board. We will then have our first keynote presentation by Ms. Moe Chiba, Chief of Culture Unit of the UNESCO Jakarta Office, followed by a panel discussion with four panelists whom I will introduce later. Without further ado, please enjoy the opening performance by Nadi Singapura. Hi, my name is Fami. I'm from Nadi Singapura. One of the irreplaceable elements in the traditional Malay music or the events and ceremonies is the sound of the drums. Rebana or gendang, a collective term used to describe the drums, has been the core of Nadi Singapura's exploration, expansion and creation. Rampak Berbano is one of Nadi Singapura's earliest works which features a mix of rhythm, distinctively performed as an ensemble on the Rebana Asli, also known as the Gendang Melayu.
It's with great pleasure that I now invite Mr. Gi Hyung Kyung, Director General of HCAP Korea, to deliver his opening remarks. Mr. Gi Hyung Kyung, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. MC, for having me today. Uh, actually, the, we are under the pressure of the pandemic, but anyway, we meet today uh, thanks to the technology and also good wills. Even though there is uh, many barriers for people, but if we have a strong will and a good intention, I believe we can overcome and then we can make a good outcomes uh, with those kind of good intention. Uh, my name is Kim ji uh, Currently, I'm in charge of directorship of the UNESCO HCAP. Thank you and be welcome all of you to the meetings on 2021 Southeast Asia collaboration meetings on safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, before starting, I'd like to express my sincere appre appre appreciation, Madam Chang Hee Ni, CEO of the Singapore National Heritage Board, for co-hosting this meeting and the each members for giving their all approach. I'm sure each and NHB can work hard together on safeguarding ICH in Southeast Asia. Each cap is building network for ICH safeguarding and has been holding the Southeast Asian collaborative meetings regularly since 2012. Additionally, each cap has been organizing and sharing information about the various ICH stakeholders. This meeting has discussed ways to network with ICH experts and stakeholders in Southeast Asia and share information related to the intangible cultural heritage. This year's theme is the role of youth in safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. UNESCO has been vigorously supporting and partnering with the youth to the world of ICH to implement 2003 convention. On the same ground, HCAP has emphasized the pivotal roles of youth in the protection and transmission of ICH. Through this meeting, we would like to share the current states of youth engagement and risks in each country and discuss the strategy to engage young generation into ICH safeguarding with experts in ICH in Southeast Asia. I believe we can get a meaningful result because of your expertise and goodies. We can together part away rather than alone faster. I sincerely hope you'll enjoy today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intention. Thank you, Mr. Gi Hyung Kyung, for your remarks. Next, it was with great pleasure that we now hear from Ms. Chang Hui Ni, Chief Executive Officer of the National Heritage Board of Singapore. Ms. Chang Hui Ni, please. Mr. Gi Hyung Kyung, Director General of UNESCO INCAP, Ms. Mo Shiba, Chief of Culture Unit at the UNESCO Jakarta Office. Prof. Lili Kong, President of the Singapore Management University, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the 2021 Symposium on Youth and their role in safeguarding intangible cultural heritage, which is jointly organized by INCHCAT and the National Heritage Board of Singapore. I hope that you enjoy the performance by Nadi Singapura, a group of young musicians we use traditional Malay drums and percussions as a medium of expression. Nadi refers to pulse or flow of consciousness, and the energetic performance powerfully captures the spirit of youthful optimism and hope that our intangible cultural heritage will continue to be transmitted 
for generations to come. Youth involvement in ICH is important because they play a crucial role in sustaining our ICH. Our youth are the future of ICH and they'll be the next generation that ensures that our ICH skills and knowledge continue to be transmitted. This is also important for us to draw on the talent, energy and enthusiasm of youth to better safeguard and promote ICH. This public seminar is held in conjunction with a biannual Southeast Asian collaborative meeting on safeguarding ICH. It is our first significant collaboration with InchCap since the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding in 2021. And I look forward to future collaboration with uh, Mr. Ge Hyung Hyun. Due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this year's this symposium is held virtually on Zoom. Although I hope that for future events, we'll be able to fiscally welcome our friends in Singapore. The pandemic has affected all of us around the world and highlighted the need for us to find new ways to address the very real challenges which ICH practitioners face. At the same time, ICH provides us with a sense of identity and belonging. Our living heritage in the form of festivals, practices, performing arts and food heritage sustains our hopes and aspirations through these difficult times. So I hope that this symposium and the meeting that follows will be an opportunity for our organizations and practitioners throughout the region to learn from each other, learn from each other's best practices and kickstart future ICH projects and collaborations of common interest. So on this note, I wish the symposium speakers and participants an insightful and rewarding session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Changwini, for your remarks. For our keynote address today, we have Ms. Moe Chiba, who will be sharing on engaging youth to lead intangible cultural heritage, observations of a UNESCO field officer. Ms. Moe Chiba is presently Chief of Culture Unit at UNESCO Jakarta Office for Brunei Darussalam, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, and Timor-Leste since 2018. She joined UNESCO HQ in 2000 and began her career in the Division of Creative Industry and subsequently in the Division of Cultural Policies, in charge of developing a new international convention of UNESCO on the diversity of cultural content and artistic expressions. After moving to UNESCO New Delhi Office for South Asia in 2006, her focus has shifted on mainstreaming culture into development process. Some of her main areas of work include heritage-based urban development, culture for rural livelihood and participation of persons with disabilities in cultural life. Moving to Jakarta, she continues her passion for culture-based development and coordinates projects such as disaster risk reduction of heritage, promotion of youth entrepreneurs around heritage sites, and cultural landscape management. Without further ado, let me hand the time over to Ms. Moe Chiba to develop her, to deliver her keynote. Ms. Chiba, please. Yes, thank you very much, John, for the introduction. I hope you can hear my voice. Okay, so let me begin by sharing my PPT. Okay, so I, I hope you can see my screen now. So, um, good afternoon. Mr. Gi Hyung Kum, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Director General of HCAP Korea, and Ms. Chang Hui Ni, Chief Executive Officer of National Heritage Board Singapore. Thank you very much for uh, having me uh, to speak at your seminar. It's a real privilege and an honor. As a UNESCO field officer, I deal with both the World Heritage Convention and the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. And I feel that the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage is sometimes much more subtle and complicated 
because as you know, the conservation of a monument could be a very top-down process with the uh, government and the uh, experts. However, the intangible cultural heritage is not the case as its transmission and continuity solely depend on people and their willingness. We cannot force their hands, nor has top-down decision ever been uh, appreciated. So to ensure the, uh, the intergenerational transmission, sorry, the, I can't move the screen, sorry. Okay, here it is. So to ensure the intergenerational transmission of ICH, well, we said we need to create a dynamic environment where the knowledge holders are proud and happy um, and to practice ICH and therefore the younger generation is eager to learn and the public appreciate that ICH. And of course, the participation of youth here is indispensable. But how to engage them uh, is a big question and which is the uh, topic of this seminar. Today, I wish to share my personal view as a field officer directly involved in the community projects rather than uh, UNESCO's institutional position. So um, some of what I'm going to say may differ from what you typically from uh, UNESCO. Therefore, please listen to it uh, just as one private point of view and not as a formal UNESCO's point of view. Now, youth. Um, when we were young, what was our uh, attention? What was the focus of attention? Very frankly speaking, I think most of us were preoccupied with dating, making friends, uh, having fun, and most importantly, securing stable and good life as a future young adult. And I think this is perfectly legitimate because young people have the right to be self-centered and preoccupied about their future because life is uncertain and securing a good stable source of income is increasingly difficult. We face that particularly during this uh, pandemic time, whether you are in Singapore, Korea, or Indonesia. And the question is, how does safeguarding intangible cultural heritage fit into this? Are we helping the young people to address their critical needs by encouraging them to safeguard ICH? Oops, sorry. In many parts of the world, the ICH custodians often live in poverty. This was the big reality I had to face uh, when I started my career as a UNESCO field officer in India. Um, the picture here uh, shows a street children performing. Those who uh, visited New Delhi must have seen these kids, you know, uh, performing this acrobatic dance on the street to get some coins. This is a typical image you would see in, um, in the big cities of India. However, not many of us perhaps know that these children most probably belong to a traditional community of itinerant dancers that we call Natuas or Nat, who used to perform at king's palaces or at the weekly market once upon a time. However, as the time changed, they lost their audience and supporters and then today they are called illegal performers and or the street beggars. This sad story is true for many of the ICH communities in India uh, where I spent quite some time. Here are the images of some of the IC ICH custodians in India. On the left side are the, uh, sorry, on the top in the middle uh, is the image of the uh, Manganyars in Rajasthan. They are talented uh, for singing and dancing and are often known as desert musicians. The ladies on the left is from a community called Pat or the Patuas, or meaning painters, uh, from West Bengal, making long scroll paintings. They used to visit different villages to narrate the stories by singing using this scroll painting. And the, another photo below is that of a bowl. Baul singers who lives in West Bengal in India or Bangladesh. They are um, spiritual confreries that be, uh, believe in God beyond Hindu or Muslim and express their love for God by singing. And therefore, their Baul songs are very famous. 
And then, by the way, it is also part of the UNESCO ICH list from uh, Bangladesh. Now, these arts may have been made very famous because some individuals were lucky enough to have commercial success, but a large part of the communities live in abject poverty. In the official statistic of the government of India, the terms that qualify them are the uh, illiterate and unskilled laborers living below the poverty line or belonging to marginalized tribal or untouchable communities. And frankly speaking, their life is not easy at all. For instance, in the village of the Patuas, you would notice that many children with some de deformities and problem with intellectual development. This is because people use uh, to marry within their community. Why? Because no community outside wanted to marry them because of their low social status. Some of the Baal singers I met used to earn daily wages by carrying the dead bodies from the police station to the morgue, and they made a peanut money out of that. And their children were often not permitted to the public schools because bowels were considered as antisocial and immoral because they don't follow the conventional marriage system. So these are just a few examples. I can cite many more examples where intangible cultural heritage is intertwined with serious poverty and the Sorry, there's some funny sound. Um, there's it's serious poverty and there's a social stigma is not an easy thing to solve. Then I moved to Indonesia in 2018. So while this country does not have an entrenched caste system as such, one also noticed that ICH custodians often belong to the marginalized communities such as rural women, minority groups, uh, religious or ethnic wise, uh, with lower income and social status. On the left top is the Gorgar uh, sculptors from Northern Sumatra, as they belong to a religious minority. And the area um, is a kind of, um, is a rural area which don't have jobs. So usually the young people prefer uh, to get out of the villages to find a job in the city. Um, then the um, the pictures on the right, perhaps some of you may be familiar, it's a nokeng fishing uh, net weaving by the communities in West Papua of Indonesia. Once again, they belong to those communities with quite low income because they don't, they live in the quite remote areas and, um, and are not part of the mainstream uh, ethnic groups of the countries. So you understand my dilemma. When their parents are economically struggling and suffer from low public appreciation, I think it's very selfish and arrogant that an international organization like UNESCO or some anthropologists tell their youth to be proud and why not continue the traditional practice. I felt that it's even more irresponsible when the kind of support we actually are offering is inventory making or some ad hoc, you know, documentation, conferences, and publications that have literally no effect in improving their financial status. So uh, my simple conclusion was to ditch that idealistic and romantic talk about ICH as just as a community pride that should not be talked about in monetary terms, but instead to focus on concrete livelihood improvement, uh, support for the ICH practitioners. I was quite lucky uh, to have come across the NGO called Bangladesh.com, which I think is a regular partner of uh, each cap. Um, in 2008, they had exactly that approach. Uh, they set community development as a primary goal, not ICH safeguarding, but community development as a primary goal. This understood as increase in the income and availability of social security. And their work seems to have obvious success compared to those entities who does cultural promotion focusing on IC elements rather than people. We work together to expand and scale the works of Bangladesh.com. Um, our flagship project uh, called Art for Life uh, Rural Development targeted more than 3,000 rural artisan performers in West Bengal and has provided 
multiple types of training, not only in ICH skills per se, but mostly in entrepreneurial skills, including accounting, cost calculation, English conversation, new product development, and marketing. The project also provided the social security and bank accounts to the community members. Sorry. Uh, one important component of the project is the regular rural art festival. The um, idea is to bring the audience yeah, to the villages, from the, from the city to the villages, so that not only the most successful artisans and musicians, but also other village members can also benefit from exposures and business opportunities. Fortunately, the project showed positive result with a quantum leap in their income level, up to the point that some of them started building a new house with a toilet. And some of you who are familiar with India's statistic, uh, you must have heard that the numbers of mobile phone holders uh, in India are larger than the, those who have the toilet at home. So having a, a house with a toilet is really a one success benchmark. Then what happened? With a steady income, the social image of ICH Bieras has improved from that of beggars to the artist. And as their parents start taking pride, the young people naturally start joining the movement. As a result, the number of practitioners increased and the average age became younger and the number of out-migration, the rural uh, urban migration also reduced because they can choose to earn income while staying in their village. So that was one example. Then uh, here's another example and initiated by the Digital Empowerment Foundation in a place called Chanderi of the Madhya Pradesh state of India. It's another interesting example where a new intergenerational dynamic uh, was created. Uh, Chanderi is a production center of a very fine cotton silk wo uh, woven textile, appreciated in uh, particularly in a hot climate. The products are quite refined and laborious, but the weavers don't make enough money. And the younger generation obviously prefer not to become weavers. And the parents actually don't encourage their children to become weavers either, because they think that that is not a li li uh, viable livelihood options. So uh, what this NGO did was to create a computer center and train the community members, especially the younger one, in IT skills. We didn't, they didn't go and, and try to convince the young people to do the weaving, but in, instead introduced the IT skills. Nowadays, um, everybody, um, everybody needs computer skills. So this project that started around 2007 naturally attracted the local youth to join the, uh, the movement. So today, the younger generation supports their parents to work with their skills in graphic design or online sales or sometimes community tourism. And because the young people learned how to use internet and access government websites, they can also assist their parents in availing government schemes. They may have decided not to become weavers themselves, but nonetheless, they're contributing to the continuity of the community traditions, and which I thought is a, quite an interesting uh, way of continuing ICH in different way. Now, then I moved to Indonesia since 2018. Uh, UNESCO office in Jakarta developed a program named Kita Muda Creative, or the We the Young Creative Youth. This is a program uh, uh, which has exactly the same approach as the two previous examples I've given. It's, uh, the program supports the young stars living around the famous heritage sites to grow into entrepreneurs. Out of some 400 uh, plus uh, beneficiaries, more than half are so-called ICH practitioners, uh, meaning uh, artisans or some are traditional musicians. And under the program, we support them to improve their knowledge and skills in basic accounting, product development, branding, and marketing using social media. Well, between 2020 and 2021, the COVID was particularly tough. And so we had to develop a new methodology for training them using uh, WhatsApp 
or uh, uploading the video tutorials on the YouTube and, and, and following up with a personal coaching using the, uh, the video chat. We also uh, assist in, in developing their personal brand and organize the online, um, online sales by inviting the potential buyers. So as you see, all these projects don't preach about importance of heritage preservation, but rather it aims at equipping the young with life skills to navigate this world. And because of this, um, all these projects are in high demand among the young people. More and more youths want to join and be part of the programs. And I believe this high interest rate seems to confirm that we are on the right track. I think nobody can blame young people for being self-centered and preoccupied with their financial security. It's how we used to be, right? And we are still like that. And if so, if we want to engage the youth in ICH safeguarding, I think we should focus on securing their financial stability. Of course, life is not only about money, you would say, but when your basic needs are not fulfilled or uncertain, it is very difficult to expect youth to be interested in ICH safeguarding, isn't it? So before we lament about the lack of youth engagement in ICH safeguarding, perhaps we should ask ourselves if our approach is relevant for young people. Well, looking at the program and the title of the presentations foreseen, I believe many of the participants share my view. And I look forward to hearing all your experience because I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to share. Now, other than life skill development, young people, there are, of course, many other things we can do to create that, what we call the conducive environment to ensure intergenerational transmission of ICH. For instance, something very basic, but it's very important to create a mechanism where the knowledge of ICH stays within the community. This sounds obvious, but actually it's more common that the data of ICH are located outside the community. Um, PhD students, media, and whatnot would love to document ICH, but they rarely share the knowledge back to the communities. So it's quite important that the communities are the ones who maintain their knowledge. So the pictures are the example of some initiatives by the different entities. Uh, this uh, community archives of traditional musician in Rajasthan, um, where the uh, archive center trained the, uh, the musicians to do their own recording. On the right is the documentation of a traditional embroidery motif by, um, by the NGO, the Kalaraksha, that they started after the major earthquake. A government, uh, beyond that, a government program to recognize the master knowledge holders. Also, it's like a very classic. I think it's also very valid strategies. Japan or Korea have this program called a living, uh, living master or living treasure that uh, recognize the, those ICH holders uh, of the highest skills. Um, in Bhutan, the king actually has started an, a national uh, annual award to recognize the folklore, uh, you know, the folk knowledge holders. Well, this is a very classic program, but I think it encourages public interest and gives uh, to use a model to aspire to. And I think this is a still a very useful program. And several entities also work to make knowledge about ICH available to create public interest. Um, the, the pictures, I think, is another regular uh, partner of each cap, uh, example of the um, a collaboration between the schools and museum to train uh, young people in batik technique from Pekalongang, Indonesia. In some places, uh, they also use the community radios uh, as a kind of agent to talk about ICH, do the recording, you know, and, and do the, uh, the public uh, narrow casting. And this is, I think, is also a, a quite a useful technique. And then, as you know, um, several governments also adopted a strategy to create a new demand for ICH-based products. So here is the example of Batik Day. 2nd of October is a Batik Day in Indonesia. So everybody wears Batik da, 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 and talk about Batik. But besides, um, all the government officials have to wear Batik on, on Friday. 
same things uh, is same technique actually is being adopted now in uh, Timor Leste. They have their national textile called Thais, and they are trying to do exactly the same thing by adopting the their traditional fabric in the uh, for the school uniform, the government officials uniform, and whatnot. And again, Bhutan, you must have heard uh, that the king once upon a time has ordered that everybody should wear a national uh, costume at schools and and in office of, uh, at workplaces. And it was very wise because without that uh, order. I think that the textile uh, industry of Bhutan must have already disappeared a long time ago. So I believe when all these efforts come together, then we are actually gradually creating conducive ground for young generation to inherit ACH, ICH as their future life option. This is a long and much wider exercise of social engineering. This is why I feel ICH safeguarding is much more challenging than just restoring an old monument. So to end, um, I wish to draw your attention that the new monitoring and evaluation uh, framework of the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention actually requests the state parties to assess how their intangible heritage safeguarding strategy contribute to the SDGs. Earlier, the countries used to report all the numbers of exhibitions they organized, number of publications, number of the conferences. No, this is not what we want to hear. We want to hear through ICH safeguarding how you actually advance the SDG goals, whether it's uh, girls' education, livelihood improvement, environmental protections, and, and whatnot. And this is why I believe uh, when we talk about youth and ICH, um, I, uh, our primary focus is addressing their livelihood needs and the future aspiration. So um, thank you very much uh, to the organizer for giving me opportunity to um, present my view. Once again, some of the uh, very business oriented point of view uh, is not a typical UNESCO's one. So don't consider my presentation as a UNESCO official point of view, but just mine. Thank you very much, John. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chiba, for your very insightful sharing. And I think it sex very nicely with the next presentation uh, by Dr. Krupa Rajangam. Uh, but before we start our panel session today, a reminder to our guests that you may use pigeonhole for the Q&As to submit your questions for our panelists. If you require language interpretation, you may toggle to the language interpretation icon and select the English channel for the English translation or the Korean channel for Korean translations as well. So our discussion today is on the topic of harnessing youth potential in crafts and performing arts. And so for our first speaker for the discussion today, we have with us Dr. Krupa Rajangam, who's conservation architect, founder and director of uh, Setu in India. Dr. Rajangam is a heritage practitioner, scholar with over 20 years of field-based experience. She is founder director of the Bengaluru-based Setu led by conservation professionals. The group works to promote conservation as an integrated, inclusive social process by bridging theory or academy, practice, fieldwork, and people's lived experiences through various initiatives, projects, and teaching, learning engagements. The most recent stint is as, as an international scholar at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, um, was undertaking a critical heritage ethnography of everyday conservation management of Hampi World Heritage Site in India. And she is currently translating her various community engagement initiatives into a social impact startup. So without further ado, let us invite Dr. Rajangam to deliver her presentation, a tale of two craftspeople moving the conversation beyond craftspeople as inheritors of tradition and bearers of burden. Dr. Rajangam, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, the National Heritage Board Singapore for inviting me to be part of the symposium. Um, and uh, I'm actually really excited to be here today because I haven't had too many opportunities to discuss my work in this with other colleagues in the Southeast Asian context. So I'm looking forward to hearing the other speakers. Um, the keynote speaker, um, I was like 
extremely excited to hear what she had to say uh, because as John said, it kind of ties in very well with what I'm trying to present today. Um, I'm just going to quickly move into sharing my screen. I hope that's fine. Everyone can see. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, the director of HCAP and uh, C, um, CEO of National Heritage Board for inviting me today. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details because um, uh, the Moi Chiba, she sort of set the context already. So I'm going to go straight in into the vignettes that I hope will bring up these two things that I wanted to talk about in terms of, you know, what we kind of typically slot crafts people as. Um, so the first sort of shattering of my romantic illusions was that I was engaged as a lead project researcher to document the craft traditions of Humpy World Heritage Site. This was a three year long project. Um, I have since sort of worked on other kind of engagements with craft traditions and with intangible cultural heritage, but this is sort of marks a turning point in my own understanding. So I'm going to largely refer to this project. So I was explaining the project and the craft person said, like, why should I talk to you? Right. So I was all about, oh, this is like intangible cultural heritage. We have to document it. There has to be a repository, exactly like the keynote speaker said. And this question kind of threw me. And then I was like, yeah, actually, why? <laughs> because uh, this is not something that I really thought about and we hadn't really quite framed it in our project as well, really well as to what does a craftsperson get from me as a researcher or an NGO working with the craftspeople, right? So um, my initial thoughts was that, you know, uh, craftspeople are sort of the inheritors of tradition. And I saw my role as bridging the gap between traditional craft knowledge and general public, right? So for me, the interest in documenting was there are these kind of intangible expressions of art and craft, and the general public is typically not aware of them. And my role is to disseminate this among the public. Um, so when I talk about the two craftspeople, I'm fictionalizing the narratives of number of craftspeople I engage with. So there's no Perumal as such, right? It's just like a fictional character. So I was engaging with Perumal, and then we were discussing his work. He is a traditional brass myth, right? So he works with brass, and he makes um, religious um, objects to be used in temple worship, but he also works for individuals if they want to make like small idols for their uh, like deities. So as we were talking, um, he told me that he wanted to discontinue his trade because um, they weren't they were in enough returns and um, it was kind of a painstaking job because typically in the village it meant that you would not pay money you would give your older brass vessel and then that would be remade and then it would be given back to the client right and then he would traditionally have got something in return which is not much maybe some grain or some produce or whatever Obviously, this shifted over time, and then he's getting money now, but this is not enough, right? Um, at the same time, while I was there, there were like a number of NGOs also working in this unnamed village. Um, and they were kind of keen that he continue to be a brass myth uh, because they felt he was uh, representative of this cultural continuity of a tradition of being a brass myth, right? Um, and like Ms. Moichiva spoke about, usually, there is an intersection between traditional caste practices in India and the caste and the socioeconomic status of the caste person, right? The two are inversely proportional. Um, a lot of this also is to do with during the colonial period, how certain sort of caste ascriptions were sort of made rigid, right? So there was a certain amount of fluidity, but it was during this period that Either you were for the state or you were kind of against the state. And if you were against the state, for example, in the state of Tamil Nadu, uh, the traditional toddy, uh, like the toddy cutters, they were given the name of the robber tribes. And that name still sticks today, right? Because they were like free. They were not under the colonial rule. So I sort of saw a parallel between this NGO trying to get Perumal to continue to practice his craft, even though Perumal was not interested. 
Um, and that's when my role point sort of changed. And then I, I thought that, okay, this doesn't seem fair. Uh, typically what is happening is the craftsperson is ending up carrying forward somebody else's past for somebody else's future, right? So he's sort of stuck in between and he's seen as this conduit of transmission of knowledge, but literally what's in it for the craftsperson, right? For him, it's a trade and he's not able to make much money out of the trade. Mm, it's not helping him sustain his family. So what is he supposed to do? So then my standpoint transformed and I thought my role was to disseminate this critical insight, right? That um, it's not just about documenting tradition, it's not about documenting intangible practices, but we as scholars, we as practitioners need to reflect back on the fact that we are putting some kind of burden on the craftsperson in the process. So um, this is continuing for a while. And then I had another sort of an ethnographic encounter with another craftsperson who was willing to spend some time with me and I followed him around. He was a stone carver, right? And he again comes from traditional stone carving uh, family. And those of you who might be familiar with Humphrey know of its like rich architectural tradition and stone carving It is seen as like the pinnacle of um, expressions in stone and it was all built like very short time frame. So when he was younger, he was located on site trying to restore, uh, this is Ishwarappa, he was trying to restore the sculptures in one of the temples in the World Heritage site. Okay, And at this instance what happened is another NGO which was focused on monument conservation kind of intervened uh, because they felt that was not being true to history, right? If the sculptures are restored, then people visiting Humpy World Heritage Site would not see a layer of history which led to the war and like sculptures being demolished. Um, so it's kind of covering up one layer of its history, right? So then you had Ishwarappa in this case who wanted to complete the sculpture, who wanted to complete what he felt he was being trained for. Because he, the way he expressed it, he said, uh, sculpture is a way to give form to a craftsperson's dream, right? So the craftsperson dreams of something and he's able to visualize it and I'm here completing it. But you had NGOs and experts like me saying, no, you can't do that because uh, this is like monumental heritage site, you have to be true to the layers of its history, right? And then I started thinking back and comparing with Perumal, right? Perumal was not interested. Ishwarappa is interested, but in that context, you had scholars and practitioners wanting Perumal to continue, but the same scholars and practitioners do not want Ishwarappa to continue in another context, right? So that's when I kind of realized that typically what we talk about culture and tradition and heritage are all social constructs. I mean, that's quite obvious, but what sank in was it's all about how we shape it in the present, right? So it's not necessarily about something that is continuing or a continuum from the past. It is how we make sense of it and what we desire will be carried forward as intangible tradition or intangible heritage, right? So that's when I felt my role would shift, okay? So now I see myself as making a case for situated knowledge, right? So by which I mean, Every craftsperson I engaged with and every historical location I engaged with merit sort of being understood within its own contextual frames of reference. Okay, so I'm no longer able to sort of prescribe an overarching policy or an overarching way of documenting or recommending, right? So this allure remains, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm still too much of a conservation architect that you can't really erase yourself that way. But it's tempered by caution because these two, the tale of these two crafts people have taught me this, right? Um, at the same time, what I've also realized as I engage deeper into ethnographic nature of work is the micro kind of informs the macro. So what's happening at a micro level with two crafts people reflects the situation of the craft sector, the intangible ethnic sector in general, and which was seen in sort of the overview that our keynote speaker gave, right? In Indonesia and in India as well. So the questions that I would like us in this symposium to sort of discuss is if we say and we agree that these are dynamic and fluid categories which are defined by the hegemony 
And by hegemony, I mean not necessarily dominant. So there is no oppression that way here, right? But hegemony, I'm talking about, uh, let's say like the official UNESCO policy, right? UNESCO is not dominant, it's hegemonic. It nudges, it, it, it's a form of leadership, right? And sometimes you do bad by thinking you're doing good, right? So I'm very glad our keynote speaker put that across. Uh, so it's about us who are in a position to be hegemonic for us to think this through. So maybe the question is not so much about recreation of historic motives as much as it is about self-ownership of the product or process. Is that what defines a craft? Is it the fact that I will decide what pattern goes on it? I will decide how it will be executed. Not so much that, you know, this is traditional Bartek or this is Patachitra, it has to be done this way and you continue to follow that, right? That's when it gets reduced to manual labor. The second question again, uh, which I'm really glad again, the overview of the keynote speaker gave, because typical engagement with crafts or with intangible heritage has been as a form of patronage, right? Of extending help to the other, right? Uh, so it's the question we have to ask ourselves, right? We are seeing them as the other who are downtrodden and who are need of help, as opposed to sort of understanding their own frames of reference, you know, like what are their everyday lives like? What are they interested in, right? And the leap from that is that maybe there are youth who are interested in taking a craft of livelihood, but they know that it's not typically seen as a career option, right? So is that where we should then be sort of intersecting with our contribution? So it's not so much about, um, so like Moishi spoke about social engineering. I mean, these are not done overnight, but these are things that I think organizations that we are all part of can sort of nudge forward. So then maybe the key question at this point is not so much asking how to engage the youth as to understand what kind of sense they already perceive in crafts and in heritage, you know, because the youth that I've engaged with over the years, I've seen that they are really interested, they are very keen. Um, and that's where like the ones who have been in the field for a very long time can, back, can temper their enthusiasm with some voice of experience, right? Uh, some kind of caution. But I think we would broadly leave it to them to take it forward. So I think our engagement would be more in understanding what are their perspectives, which aspects of it do they find to be of relevance, and what can we offer from experience to sort of move the conversation along. Um, yeah, these are the three questions I want to ask. And that's it. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajangam, for your sharing. Uh, next up, we have Ms. T. Mai Wado, Operation Manager at the Foundation for International Development and Relief, FIDR, in Vietnam. She has more than seven years of experience working with people of ethnic minorities in central Vietnam. She specializes in rural development and is responsible for overall operations in a series of FIDR rural development programs, and holds an MA in Economic Management and Rural Community Development. Ms. Do's presentation today is titled Lessons Learned from Working with Kotu Ethnic Minority for Preserving Traditional Intangible Culture. So without further ado, let me hand time over to Ms. Do to deliver her presentation. Ms. Do, please. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Let us share my PowerPoint. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, let I separately for my team to share with you our lesson learned from working with the two ethnic minority for preserving traditional intangible cultures. So, let I introduce a little bit my organizations. We are Japanese based IHEOs established in 1990s, and we have the totally so far four country office in Cambodia, Nepal, Vietnam, and headquartered in Japan. And our majors is mainly focused in two sectors. One is community development, and the second is on the emergency relief. So our office so far in Vietnam, as you may know, Vietnam is a long country from the north to the south, and we are based in the Da Nang city, the center of Vietnam. And you know, our project size mainly focused in the central, it's in Guangnam province, so this area is very unique because 
most of the people here is ethnic minorities, and the population up here account for around 90% of the ethnic groups. So it's very special areas. And how, how we can evolve on the generation specialist for the youth inside the preserving intangible skills. So let I introduce with you who are they? Who are the two people? Yes, the two people there, they have the nickname very interesting. They call them is the people of the forest because many of their life have you stay still stay living from the forest, have still living from the planting. So they have the semi self sufficient life and have very, very unique and interesting traditional cultures like their dancing, their cuisine, their handicraft, including weaving and greetings. So let us share with you how we involve them in our program to protect and preserve their intangible cultures. Totally, we have around three stages to involve them in this process. The first stage we call, we try to do the preserve and develop the traditional weaving from almost 15 years ago. Yes. And the second one, after to let them learn more about the skill of the weaving, we try to link them with the communities by tourism as the second phase. You know, at that time, the visitors start to visit these areas and they recognize, oh, this unique culture is very beautiful and they want to learn more. So with the first wheel as the traditional weaving preservation and the second wheel of the state two communities by tourism, we try to handle this one and combine this one to make it become phase three, how to do the comprehensive social development from that. They can let the intangible cultures become the tangible uh, things so that all communities will be happy each other. Yes, and talking a little bit about the youth, we all know that the youth characteristics, they are very eager to learn new things like Mr. Mojasi Basti. And the youth also, yes, first thing about economics, maybe it's very popular all over the world. All people think that uh, it's better to put economy to involve the youth in the inter intangible preserving culture. However, with us, if only economy is not enough, why is it like that? Because to earn money, maybe the just easy to find another sector more simple and more easy rather than preserving the intangible culture, right? However, we consider a lot and we decide to put a lot of device to involve the youth. We call this like attractive food to collect the youth come inside our chat, something like that. That is what, uh, besides the economy, sure, we need to create the income benefits for the, for the youth. We also let them how to apply the SNS because now we are living in the technology time, right? So it's very easy for them to apply SNS in their preserving uh, work. Or beside that, because the youth, they sometimes they not recognize their own value from their cultures. So how to let them recognize this one by receive the appreciations, appreciation from the outsiders. So that we link them with the community space tourism. And step by step, when they receive the, wow, it's very beautiful, your culture is very nice from that one, they step to step to re recognize their real value in the intangible cultures. And even with the apply the modern technology, uh, yes, one of the characteristics of the youth is they want to make relationship, they want to have the new friends. So if we can create the encounters, like we can connect them with the outsider and let them have more happy and feel enjoyable when work with the group members, they will feel more happy and continue to involve to this um, preserving intangible cultures. And when we can diversify the, uh, the attractive food for the youth, sure, we can do well their role in this preserving intangible cultures. Why is it like that? Because some basic work related with the marketing or finance or even IT literacy, just only you can do and can have the stand to adapt well rather than other generation in community, is right? And in any, any community, yes, we divide them, we categorize them by three level. That's either youth generation, that's either middle generation and seniors. So if only you, is it okay for them to continue preserving their intangible cultures? It may not in a condition. Why is it like that? Because when the youth in charge of the marketing are doing some kind of accounting or IT literacy, 
for their preserving skills, they need the motto, they need the middle generation to be the bridge between youth and senior to connect them each other. And the middle generation, they have enough trust from their community because their life experience now. So with their negotiation skills, leaderships, they can easy to manage the groups and how can hand over with the youth and the seniors. From that, the youth can easy to imagine the role and can learn more from the middle generation. And for the seniors, for either role in community and in intangible preserving cultures. Yes, all of them can sell up their wisdom and skills. And all of them can sell how to guide the natural their skill because only seniors can recognize their treasure, can recognize their real value rather than the youth people. So, okay, how we can make the stage for the youth can dancing on that? So seniors and middle generation can be the good page to let the youth be shy and be more attractive in the preservance of the intangible cultures. That's our message, how we can let them all feel the role and their important like identity in their communities. So easy to let them evolve in this work. Yeah, and with our experience in doing community development, in order to have the good community, it's necessary to have the three key factors. This is involvement, this is connection, and this is social cohesion. Why? Because when we can involve on the generation, especially for the youth inside of the community development and intangible heritage protection, so we can connect on the youth with youth, youth with women, or even youth with other people in the society. From that, they can make very strong communities and they can show up how much their communities is strong and how much they can preserve their traditional cultures. And not only of that, for involve more and more youth can call the look like I call the is interest, the experiment to the youth. Is it considered to put three more factors that is very important for the youth based on their characteristic? First one, how to let the intangible to tangibles. This means how we can make the visualization. Why is it like that? For example, we can skill is intangible skill, right? And if we can make the weaving skill become the weaving goods, like for example, like this product, yes, it's very visual and easy to let the Youth and also the outsider recognize the, and understand the value of the intangible cultures. From that, they are that easy to have the direction, how they can evolve and how they can preserve their intangible cultures. And the second one, when we talk about youth, we always think about the future, right? And without clear career path, uh, it's very hard to let them estimate their life. So it's better create the clear career path. Uh, I can say procedure for futures so that the youth easy to estimate and invest their value. And the third one, the youth often have the idols, right? So if we can create some kind of the assistant of the role models in the community, ah, I want to be that lady, uh, I want to be that man, so that it's very easy for them to have the mojo to follow and have more motivation and equipment to involve in this intangible skill. And from that, the youth will feel more safety. When I say safety, because they are maybe no need to go out their community anymore. They can stay inside the village, but they can introduce and preserve the intangible skill and also can feel more pride because they receive a lot of the high appreciation from outsider through the CBT motor. And from that, they have the hopes, they have the hopes for the bright futures. So that are very easy to recognize and sharing the value among the societies. So I hope that this kind of the very safety, pride, and how we can create for the youth from that, they can evolve more and more in preserving intangible cultures. And it's not only one time or two times that we involve the youth, right? We want to keep it continuously, the involvement of the youth. So how we can do, yes, we can diversify the event. For example, today event, today's symposium is very important because we involve a lot of the youth come inside. Because if only the senior talk together, it may not maximize the means of the workshop, right? But when the youth come inside, they can recognize, ah, 
how much important their role is. So from that, we have more motivation to, uh, oh, I need to make action, something like that. And um, through some kind of the tourism activities, or the trying to make the restaurant ourselves. So the youth easy to recognize and listen the appreciation from the outsider, from the customer, from that they know what is good and what is they need to improve more for their intangible skill and for their culture preservations. Yeah. And besides that, uh, we can think uh, how to make the new products from the intangible to tangibles. So let them create more and more. Yes, try to put many, many new products for them and then they will be happy when they can introduce something to the new world. Uh, um, next, maybe, maybe some of you may know, uh, we have the, some kind of international fashion show to show up the intangible weaving clothes, something like that. So they are very happy to show in this type of event. From that, we can make the solidarity for the whole communities so that the youth can continue to keep the motivation for expand their actions in preserving the intangible skills. Yeah, and then actually you have the two people, they involved in our project and how they want to contribute to the preservation. I'm very happy in enjoyable. Uh, even through the CBT tourism, when the outsider come, they can do the very good interaction with the outsider and they're happy when receiving and sell up their intangible cultures to the outsiders. Or even when we organize some kind of event in another city, they can go out of their village and observe the world outside and they can have the communication with outsider, can make a link. They're very happy about that. Um, and especially under the COVID time, yes, kind of have the direct interaction, right? So the Kati youth people, they have the one of very great idea that they established set up one kind of the online tour. Yes, they don't want to stop the connection between them and the outsiders. So they try to do the apply the modern technique to keep to do the online tour for introduce their intangible counter to all over the world. And with trial, with restaurant uh, shops. Sure, this is very clear sample to sell up the intangible become tangible goods. So from that on, people happy together and can share the culture each other through their cuisine style, through their traditional cooking, etc. Yep. And yes, you can see their SNS information they are uh, developed. So this one is one of the very evident that the cultural youth people they are involved and continue to support for the seniors and middle how to keep preserving the intangible cultures. It's very nice. And as I say, one of the great ideas for cultural online tours so far they are or uh, they already developed two kind of the tours. One is cultural life experience tour, and one is the um, a weaving handicraft experience. So if you want to see how the youth in this village, they activate, they are activate and they doing the preservation, their intangible cultures, please come and join with us through this email. Yes. And finally, I would like to say thank you to the, the two people, to our FIDR team for their great efforts during last 15 years, because you can see in this picture, we can see the very bright future, the hopeless among them, even the seniors, the middle generation are the youth, and even for the kids. So all happy together to show up their preservation, show up their intangible cultures, and on way welcome the new friends to their village. So thank you so much for your listening. I'm very happy if this model can be applied for some kind of areas at the same characteristic with the two people. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much, Tristel. Yes. Thank you. So for our next speaker, we have Ms. Yafika Ata Salehin. Ms. Salehin achieved her bachelor's degree in music with honors and her master's of music, both in music composition, from the Yong Siu Do Conservatory of Music in 2013 and 2016. As a composer, Yafika's works have been performed locally and internationally. Her music embodies a unique voice that stems from her footing as a classically trained musician and a traditional arts practitioner. A passionate advocate of traditional Malay music, she is self-taught accordionist and a music director of Gendang Akustika, an urban-based Malay folk music ensemble in Singapore. 
Established in 2009, the Ensemble champions the preservation and progression of Malay folk music performance and education in Singapore. It is currently working on its online presence through digital content that bridges communities and reaches out to new audiences in an effort to keep a part of Singapore's traditional arts and heritage alive. Her presentation today is titled Of Adopting and Adapting Youths and the Continuity of Urban-Based Malay Folk Music in Singapore. Without further ado, let us invite Ms. Salehin to deliver her presentation. Ms. Salehin, please. Thank you, John. It is a great honor to be here today to share with you this humble presentation of mine entitled Of Adopting and Adapting Youths and the Continuity of Urban-Based Malay Folk Music in Singapore. Let me share my slides. All right. So in this presentation, I share my thoughts, my observations and experiences as a youth practitioner of traditional Malay music in Singapore. My perspective comes from my experiences as the director of Gendang Akustika, an urban-based Malay folk music ensemble in Singapore. And I will bring to light what it means to be a youth practitioner and what this entails for the future of the art form. My sharings revolve around the synergies between two words, adopt and adapt. Two similar sounding words that might be confused for each other, but each have significantly different meanings. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, to adopt is to, to accept or to start to use something new. To adapt, on the other hand, is to change your ideas or behavior to make them suitable for a new situation. These are the word definitions used in the context of my presentation. Now, there are three segments to this presentation. The first is to adapt is adapt to adopt, learning the trade, which has to do with how youth practitioners adapt themselves to take on the art form. The second is adapt to adopt, embracing 21st century communications, which has to do with how performance traditions are transforming the way to stay relevant in the current world. And the third, adopt to adapt, building a sense of identity, which has to do with how the art, bomb, art form builds cultural and national identity and its significance for Singapore in a globalized world. The Malay peoples are an Austronesian ethnic group who predom predominantly occupy the Malay Peninsula, Eastern Sumatra and coastal, coastal Borneo, in addition to other smaller land, islands and lands between these lands. Singapore is a multicultural nation with a population of 5.69 million people in 2020 and Malays make up 15%. Now, traditional Malay music is an all-encompassing term which refers to the numerous musics of the Malay people such as Kompang, Dike Barat and Genang Silat. Our focus today is on Malay folk music. Malay folk music has gone through years of evolution and assimilation to become the syncretic form of music that it is today. Urban-based Malay folk music can be used to refer to the folk music that has developed in the urban communities. This music has expanded to include other instruments that are not conventionally used in the past, such as a bass and electric guitar. And this is just an aspect of the contemporization of Malay folk music in the urban communities today. Let's watch this video. So you see these two videos are of Malay folk music. The first one is an excerpt of a recording of the late Hamza Dolman, a well-respected Malaysian singer and violinist of the 1950s, accompanied by his ensemble, Orkes Hamza Dolman. The second video is a performance by my own ensemble, Gendang Akustika, 
As you can see, the instrument, instrumentation is very different, but in essence, the music is the same. Here's a little bit about my ensemble, Gendang Akustika, which I now refer to as GA. It's an urban-based Malay folk music ensemble, which I lead as a music director and perform with, with as an accordionist. It champions for the preservation and progression of urban-based Malay folk music performance in Singapore. Before playing Malay folk music, I was classically trained in piano at a young age of five. When I was 14, I watched a Malay music ensemble play at a wedding one day, and I fell in love with the accordion. I wondered to myself, this is part of my culture, but why had I not learned this in school? This curiosity grew stronger as I got older, and I managed to get my hands on the accordion at age 16. But for some reason, I couldn't find a one-to-one -one instructor, so I had to rely on my prior knowledge of music and my listening skills to learn the stylistic performance of Malay folk music on the accordion. My teachers were music recordings and live performances from other senior practitioners in and beyond Singapore. And with much dedication and persistence, this was how I was able to adapt myself to learn and adopt Malay folk music. The point I'm trying to make here is that learning Malay folk music in Singapore is not so straightforward. Many of my comrades in the scene have also had to adapt themselves to learn and play Malay folk music, mostly through trial and error. Some of them, like me, came from Western classical trained background, while others came from bands that play pop or rock genres. Our, star our stories are all different, but in the end, we, going, we went into our roots. Our prior musical experience became a point of entry into Malay folk music. And this is a case with some of the musicians from Bendang Akusika. Our youth music musicians that you see here learned their instruments either from private tutelage with a teacher or from rigorous training in their co-curricular activities in school. They know Western notation. And as fate would have it, it was such great fortune that Gendang Akusika found them. They were very eager to learn the music of their heritage for a change. But unlike Western classical music, written notation does not exist formally. Malay folk music. So as the director, music director of Gendang Akusika, it was my responsibility to help these musicians enter the world of Malay folk music. And this was done by specifically arranging the folk music repertoire of their, for their instruments in Western notation so that they can play, learn and immerse themselves in the music. And in this sense, I have adapted Malay folk music for these musicians, while they in turn adapted themselves to the performance style of the music. And due to this unique situation, GA's own renditions of Malay folk music is original and attractive because of the crafted music. Western notation became an entry point for my young friends to adopt Malay folk music. These youths are now part of the core team of the ensemble and are taking on leadership roles with the ensemble activities. Urban-based Malay folk music scene in Singapore has been growing in the past decade. In addition to the public cultural performances and collaborations with traditional Malay dance scene, this growth was also fueled by a thriving wedding entertainment service and industry in the Malay community. The demand for Malay folk music in weddings showed that the art form was able to remain relevant to Malays in Singapore. It was during this time period in 2008 that GA was founded. The ensemble was very active in the wedding scene and had been able to financially sustain itself for the past 13 years through the wedding and the engagements that we get on top of other stage performances or corporate events. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit Singapore, live music for weddings came to a complete halt. Globally, performing arts were then increasingly shifting to digital platforms and GA felt that we needed to do the same to stay alive and active. We focus our efforts to build an online presence and embrace 21st century communications, here referring to online digital platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, and the likes of it. But in order to do so, we also needed to adjust the way we work. We couldn't just continue performing like we did before. There was a need to transform our performance traditions to adopt technological advances in communications. 
We started to showcase more of our music through our social media platforms by making music videos. And we started when we couldn't even meet each other last year. COVID year gave to the rise, uh, sorry, to the, to the phenomenon of stay at home videos, which where music ensembles made videos in which mu individual musicians, they recorded themselves at home with a backing track and then the videos are then put together post-production to form a cohesive performance of the whole group. So Gena Kusika started to adopt this trend and we were very, we are very fortunate to have dedicated members in doing this, all for the sake of staying relevant and alive during these difficult times. PA also took advantage of the schemes and initiatives by the National Arts Council of Singapore to create different kinds of digital content. So one example of this is NAC's Arts in Your Neighbourhood, an initiative which aims to bring quality arts to the heartlands of Singapore. Due to COVID, this initiative went digital and GA was commissioned to produce a 40-minute program called Dindang Warisan, which translates to Songs of Heritage. This program was curated with a focus on past series, a residential estate in Singapore, highlighting its history and heritage. Not only did we perform music, we curated the program to include other elements such as interviews from a former residence and also fringe workshop activities which GA musicians conducted with the primary schools, uh, school students in the neighbourhood. Adapting to circumstances pushed GA to adopt 21st century communications and to stay relevant and alive in the online world. The urban-based Malay folk music community must accept that the wedding entertainment service industry may not return to its former state and ensembles must take other initiatives to continue to thrive. GA has had to look into other innovative and attractive ways of presenting its music in digital form in order to spread awareness of our music, to create interest and grow our audiences even beyond our home ground. GA's, GA's venture into the digital world is only beginning and we hope to find solutions to make it more sustainable for us in time to come. A sense of identity reinforces a sense of belonging to a place or a community. It is our connection to home. Singapore is a country where every race is welcome to practice and preserve its culture and traditions. Each race's distinct cultural identity contributes to a growing Singaporean identity that is rooted in multiculturalism. For a young nation of 54 years, Singapore's unique integrated culture and identity helps to make its presence known in an increasingly homogenized world. Having said that, the uh, traditional arts and culture can be used as a platform to support and encourage the Singaporean multicultural identity. Transcultural collaborations can be seen as meaningful efforts that help break social barriers and promote integration and strengthen mutual, mutual understanding and respect for each other's cultural practice, art forms and a way of life. GA experienced this firsthand when we were invited to perform with the Siong Ling Musical Association, a performing arts organization in Singapore that preserves and promotes Nanyin music. It was a performance called Perform Memoirs of Nanyang, a Nanyin musical, and we were involved in a combined song item that brought Nanyin and Malay music styles together. This left a lasting impression on me. So you see, in adopting multicultural, multiculturalism in some aspects of our performance meeting, making, we are adapting to Singapore's growing society and collective cultural identity.
4GA, this may pave the way to grow an appreciation and interest in urban-based Malay folk music in young and new audiences, even beyond that of the Malay community. I see transcultural collaborations as a means for the traditional arts groups and practitioners to come together and support each other and to explore refreshing ways of promoting our art forms to young, younger audiences. As a conclusion, many urban-based Malay folk music practitioners such as myself are concerned about the continuity of our art form in the future. We do feel responsible in helping to safeguard the art form and to help it evolve as well to grow new audience who will be our future patrons and funders. We will constantly face the dynamics between adapting and adopting and it will be up to us to find a balance and to make the right decisions for our future of the traditional arts. It is difficult, but as the Malay says, Kalau tak kita, siapa lagi? Who else if not us? Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tefima. So for our last speaker, we have Mr. Song Singh. Mr. Singh is currently a Senior Program Coordinator for Culture and Arts Education at Cambodian Living Arts. Previously, Singh served as a producer, manager, facilitator and arts administrator at CLA and was extensively involved in the first 10 years of the organization's early work in reviving traditional Cambodian art forms and intangible cultural heritage. Singh's current role centers on building culture and arts education into Cambodia's education system, working in partnership with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports, the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts and UNESCO. This project is funded by UNESCO and involves the integration of ICH into arts and culture curriculums in Cambodia's public schools. Singh's dream is to see every Cambodian learn the arts and to see Cambodia contribute traditional and contemporary artistic expression and best practices to the global arts community. In his presentation today, he will share more about harnessing youth participation in reflecting a modern Cambodia and relevant social issues through intangible cultural heritage. Mr. Singh, please. Okay. Um... So thank you, John, uh, for uh, your introduction and also for your moderation. And, and also thanks uh, the meeting for having me here uh, today. I'm so excited uh, to be one of the panelists um, in this uh, 2021 uh, Southeast Asian Collaborating Meeting on uh, Safeguarding uh, ICH um, under the theme of Harnessed uh, Youth Potential in Performing Arts. So let me uh, share the screen with you um, to start my presentation. Okay, so to launch with uh, the things uh, I'll share with you uh, how uh, Cambodian living arts uh, involve young uh, people in our work of uh, safeguarding uh, ICH. But uh, first of all, let me uh, share you guys a little bit about Cambodian living arts. So Cambodian living art is uh, a not-for-profit not organization uh, founded in 1998 by the founder and John Pond who is a Cambodian musician, human rights activist, and a survivor of Khmer Rouge regime. He is an advocate for the healing and transformative power of the arts and especially uh, music. From uh, the beginning um, up until by 2012, uh, Cambodian Living Arts supported 16 masters who survived from the Khmer Rouge uh, in order to uh, pass on or to transmit their knowledge who have gained before Khmer Rouge to the next generation. So we uh, got uh, around 1,000 students uh, by then. But up until now, uh, we, according to uh, 
the time we now have only uh, eight masters still uh, alive, uh, but the others, while the others have gone uh, according to their age. And you see here uh, the photo uh, on the top. Uh, that's was the master that we uh, have have been uh, we had uh, worked with uh, to transmit their knowledge. So that photo was take the that photo was taken into uh, in two thousand five during the master uh, retreat. And you can see uh, at the bottom on the right hand side that's the uh, John Paul who uh, is the founder. Of of uh, Cambodian living arts. So according to the rapid change uh, in the context of Cambodia's development, let me uh, uh, show you the evolution of uh, Cambodian living arts, how Cambodian living arts travels you know, from the beginning until now. So according to uh, uh, what we can see, a lot of changes uh, rapidly happen in Cambodian development not just only uh, the economy, but also especially uh, the human resources. So as you can see that, uh, you know, from time to time, uh, many of our master uh, pass away, but at the same time, uh, the student who have got uh, knowledge, great knowledge from those masters, uh, very, very skillful and, and perform very well. Uh, but uh, they are, they were still in the number, uh, like a small number, that uh, we think that it's hard for us to uh, uh, to like to uh, give this impact uh, across Cambodia. And uh, because of this, you know, uh, Cambodian living art uh, 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 also uh, evolved itself from doing to facilitating and also to being a catalyst. Uh, by focusing from uh, even our focuses, we also evolve from transmission and sustainability and creativity. Let me uh, explain about this a bit. Uh, so from doing, uh, that means that uh, like at the beginning, when the, the time we started, we worked directly with the surviving masters uh, at their communities uh, across Cambodia. Uh, to uh, transmit uh, the traditional performing arts skill to the young generation so that uh, we can ensure there is no loss, you know, or no disappear, that's disappearing again, uh, like the, the Khmer Rouge. And after that, after we see that uh, uh, some uh, particular number of uh, uh, Cambodian, young Cambodian artists who have uh, learned a lot from those masters, uh, they they need also to uh, develop further and also to find a place of opportunity to uh, expand their knowledge or their potential uh, more than this. That's why we also we, we think that it's good to uh, not just not uh, doing like uh, working with them directly and then uh, provide a training them uh, anymore, but let them do that. They are on their own, and we should, uh, you know, step back and then support it, support them uh, by providing the opportunity as well as funding and uh, finding out uh, what uh, their needs so that we can support them. Um, so this is uh, what we are uh, evolving uh, our uh, self uh, from the beginning up until now. Okay, all right, so now um, this is how uh, Cambodian Living Arts uh, support as well as involve uh, young people in uh, safeguarding ICH in this contemporary Cambodia. So we uh, actually we have many more projects, but here I just want to uh, highlight uh, just uh, some uh, projects that uh, how we engage the young people in uh, our work. So there are two uh, type of uh, young group of people. One is a public youth engagement, uh, and then the other is the young uh, artist. So uh, for the public youth, uh, what we uh, uh, have been working and uh, involved them in is, uh, one is the culture, culture and arts education in public schools. <clears throat> so this is um, one of uh, the, the pilot uh, programs 
uh, Cambodia Living Arts work um, right now until now uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports and UNESCO and also Ministry of uh, culture and fine arts in Cambodia, so that we can find a way to integrate uh, arts education into uh, public school system. Uh, so that uh, this is how we, we try to um, engage, uh, you know, like public school uh, students uh, to learn and to uh, to even uh, to understand more about uh, Cambodian uh, traditional arts as well. And uh, the other project that we also uh, uh, engage uh, the art, uh, the youth uh, in in uh, the arts uh, program is about youth engagement fund uh, for youth led initiative. So this is uh, the project that we uh, always support a youth group um, who have a good idea in terms of how to uh, promote, you know, ICH. Uh, can be just uh, only one program of their own or can be part of their programs. Um, and I will show you more about this uh, <coughs> later. And the other is about volunteer opportunity. Um, so this is the opportunity that we always open uh, to uh, uh, public youth to uh, join our movement in any uh, programs that we have for or organized for public, for example, like festival or <clears throat> even other uh, uh, arts uh, demonstration in the community, in rural areas, something like that. So the other part is about um, uh, how to involve and support uh, young artists. So uh, in Cambodia Living Arts, uh, right now we uh, offer uh, like scholarship uh, to the young people. Uh, sorry, to young artists, um, because in Cambodia, uh, the, the funding opportunity uh, is very, really uh, less uh, opportunity. Uh, but before we had this, uh, we actually we do not have any uh, scholarship uh, for uh, the artists, especially young artists who really need to uh, advance their uh, skill more and more uh, so that they can improve or they can uh, learn uh, uh, how they can be more creative in in their skills and also uh, commissioning um, commissioning is this a uh, uh, grant that uh, Cambodian Living Arts creates to uh, provide uh, like a package of funding to an artist to those who really wants to um, create new work new artwork so that they can uh, express uh, their their, their own their, uh, themselves or express about their community problem or issue or whatever. So this is something that we, we're doing. And also, uh, <coughs> sorry, a presentation platform. Um, this happens through the, the festival as well that we organize. We always include uh, a, a, a time for them to use as a platform where they uh, can engage with their audience, their peers, uh, or like artists that to uh, have more dialogue or uh, talk around ICH. So come back to uh, the youth, uh, public youth engagement, like uh, here, as I uh, mentioned earlier, about uh, culture and art education in a school uh, and public school system. Um, so we uh, do uh, we focus on, on two things for as a part of this program. One is um, we create we worked with uh, some particular uh, high schools uh, for to create an art class for grade seven to nine um, by like developing uh, like syllabi, developing a lesson plan and other uh, teaching materials. Uh, so here you can see uh, some uh, activities of the students um, because in Cambodia, as you know, like talking about art education in public school, uh, it's, it's hard to mention that they have a proper uh, arts class uh, sometimes just, just in the, the curriculum, but actually they, they lack of uh, resources such as teachers, something like that. 
So uh, this is some activities uh, and the, the students really enjoy it. But also um, we have uh, like after school, uh, uh, we call it after school uh, club. So this uh, for those who are really interested, especially uh, the student who have not had a chance uh, to be in the art class with us because we just only pick up a particular school. Uh, it's not yet uh, with other school. That's why uh, for those who are not really part of that school, they still have the chance to come and join this uh, after school uh, club. And this is some of the, uh, of the activity that we uh, took uh, the students uh, after school to join uh, to see the exhibition uh, in the French uh, embassy in Cambodia and they really uh, love it and they brought their families and friends also along with them to see this. And uh, about the use, uh, as I said, this is some uh, uh, pictures of uh, activities that we um, work with a group, uh, some group of uh, Jews uh, to, uh, to create uh, like a project is called Art Demonstration in Communities. So we, uh, we just uh, have some funding and then we give to them. Uh, so all the organization has to be led and organized by their own groups. As for the young artists, uh, as I mentioned, there's a scholarship. Uh, so we, um, during the scholarship program for the artists who uh, receive the scholarship from us, because some need uh, some uh, money to, uh, 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 to advance their skills, to learn more skill in their arts or music uh, uh, skills. But uh, some artists, they just need, uh, you know, like to, to learn English so that they, they can use it as a way uh, to communicate for their arts, to promote their arts. And the publishing, this is uh, uh, the, uh, the activity, uh, sorry, the artwork or the production that's uh, created or uh, formed by uh, young artists. Uh, so some some uh, artists they really uh, create uh, the, the, a contemporary work, but based on the roots uh, movement, based on the traditional, uh, because those are the skills that they learn from. And some uh, musician they just put uh, together different uh, instruments, um, and then they uh, create new music out of uh, the mixture of those instruments. Yeah, and uh, the below part are the, the platform where, uh, you, know, you know, like the artists and also as leaders, practitioners and audience uh, come together and join a discussion and uh, ask questions and answer. And this is just a, a quote that I, I started you know, from uh, uh, one of the research uh, by Amanda Roger uh, that's called uh, Creative Expression and Contemporary Arts uh, Making among young Cambodian that says young artists are moving on from using the Khmer Rouge as a starting point for creative expression and are interested in a variety of social issues. And also another uh, quote from one of our um, uh, young artist uh, whose name is Jung Visna and he is also a choreographer and a dancer. It says that I want to show everyone who had the same experience as me to stand up and fight back. They can do it as I really did. People criticize and devalue who I am doing by saving that a classical dancer like me is useless. They criticize us because we are gay. I want to encourage our young people who are experiencing any form of discrimination to be hopeful because people in Cambodia nowadays are more open to LGBT. Our country is moving forward. So in my conclusion, I just want to uh, conclude that ICH is not a fixed object. ICH is not just about the past, but ICH is a part of daily life. And no matter what a particular art form 
would be a traditional one, but the artists or the young people that bring it to life or convey its content are still part of contemporary Cambodia, and they serve to keep traditional art forms relevant. As a result, ICH will continue to evolve with future generations through the living arts. So that's uh, my end of the uh, presentation. So thank you so much for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Song Singh. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now be moving on to the Q&A session. Uh, you can submit your questions through pigeonhole, and you can also vote on any questions that have already been submitted. Uh, and the website is www.pigeonhole.at and the key, uh, the password is NHBICHCAP. Questions with the highest number of votes will stand a better chance to be answered by the speakers. So today we're very pleased to have with us uh, Professor Vinita Sinha, who's a professor of the Department of Sociology at the National University of Singapore as our moderator for the Q&A session. Dr. Sinha holds a master in social, Master's in Social Science from NUS and a Master's of Arts degree and a PhD from the Johns Hopkins University. Her research interests include Hindu, Hindu religiosity in the diaspora, religion, state encounters in colonial and post-colonial moments, Eurocentric and androcentric critique of classical sociological theory, pedagogy, and innovating alternative teaching practices. Um, she's widely published and is also associate editor of the Sociological Quarterly, editorial board member of the American Ethnologist, current sociology and co-editor of the Rutledge International Library of Sociology. Dr. Sina, over to you, please. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's, it's really nice to, to have just heard a fascinating uh, set of voices on the topic of youth and potential in uh, crafts and performing arts. Um, it's uh, John, we have 30 minutes for Q&A. We're running a bit behind time. Can we assume that we'll carry on for 30 minutes? OK, that's great. Thank you. Uh, so I'm really pleased, uh, and I'm sure you have also been excited by what you heard. Uh, we heard a variety of voices uh, from India, from Vietnam, from Cambodia, and Singapore. And interestingly, we also heard uh, from individuals who are involved in curating various uh, crafts and performing arts programs, but we also heard from practitioners themselves, including youth practitioners, and I think that's a really important uh, presence and voice uh, that, that we can learn from. So, as John has said, we have uh, uh, the pigeonhole function through which you can submit your questions, and uh, depending on the votes, uh, I will try and uh, you know, ensure that your questions are addressed to the relevant speaker and answered. So I, I think one of the important, a uh, couple of very important observations that have been made uh, by the speakers, and I'll just say, you know, very briefly before I move on to the questions. And I think the first one is really to uh, not approach the category of youth as a homogenous category, because it's obviously very, very diverse. And, you know, I think, I think Mr. Seng, at the, right at the end there, provided a very nice way of looking at youth by speaking to, uh, you know, the categories of uh, young artists on the one hand and public youth on the other. And I think it's, you know, the, the, the strategies and interventions that one comes up with to harness youth potential in crafts and performing arts would depend on which category of youth we are talking about. And then the other uh, issue that really, I think, uh, was driven home by all of the speakers was really the idea that ICH is not just about the past, but that it's constantly evolving and changing. And, you know, this can actually be a leveraging point for attracting young people so that, you know, they, they don't just think of, of arts and performing art, uh, arts as something that's stuck in the past or, or traditional. Um, so, so with that, I'm actually going to turn to the pigeonhole because we do have uh, questions coming in. And uh, the, the first question that I want to address is to uh, Ms. Doe. Uh, and the question is, you know, how can we reduce uh, generation crisis between younger and uh, older generations, uh, you know, in terms of, of uh, 
dealing with, with ICH. Uh, Ms. Joe, would you like to take that question, please? Okay, thank you, professors. So, very interesting questions. So, you know, for to deal the gap between the old and the young and to deal the crisis among the generations like doing the preservation ICH. So, how our role is how we can let them recognize the importance of the cooperation to preserve their cultures. They need to sit and cooperate together to discuss what is the essential value can be kept for their intangible cultures. However, for the modern life, maybe it's the youth also want to train uh, to have some kind of creative to introduce to outsiders. So if they can discuss and can decide which parts can keep at the core value and which parts they can flexible to train to adapt with the new life. For example, in the weaving groups, uh, we have experience like that. Uh, the people, the two people, they decide to keep their motive, their pattern at the core value that wouldn't change. However, for the color combination among the thread, uh, the material to weave, they can be, they can change so that both sides can happy and the young generation can have the more time and more place for create uh, the new idea for the intangible culture become the tangible products. So this is very important to let them decide and sit together to recognize how is the important of the corporations each others. Is it clear for my answer to all of you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comprehensive but brief answer. Uh, the next uh, two questions I'm going to address to Ms. Shafika because uh, they're kind of related. So the first question is, have there been opportunities for synergies with other Malay music groups in Singapore? And how can that enhance the propagation of Malay folk music? And the related question is, uh, could you share uh, what have been some of the challenges of attracting young Singaporeans to become full-time cultural performing artists? Ms. Shafika, over to you, please. Okay, thank you, Professor Vinita. All right, so, Yes, in fact, there, there has been, you know, synergies in terms of getting groups um, in traditional Malay music to come together and uh, make music. And this, has, this just started four years ago, actually, in 2018, where it's actually a, um, a festival of traditional Malay music. And it, it combines together traditional Malay music practitioners and groups in Singapore that in fact has come about because of the, um, like I said earlier, the industry, the wedding service industry. And um, in this in this manner, in this kind of uh, synergy, we there are certain things that were happening um, in that particular festival, um, which I was part of as well. So in, in that, um, the, the first installment of the festival saw us coming together and making a kind of like a collective um, showcase of traditional Malay music, uh, which was really very difficult because there are actually like, you know, 12 uh, to 6 uh, about 14 to 16 groups at that time. Um, and uh, how do you showcase uh, traditional Malay music in such a way that is um, fair to all musicians? That was uh, one of the challenges that we faced. But uh, I, I should say that uh, it was a really good run because that festival itself it introduced uh, a program like Rentas, which is basically a, a residency program that that call um, youths uh, within the scene to come together to create music, new music out of the traditional practice. Um, so I was a part of that as well. And so hopefully this kind of movement can help to um, sort of look into make traditional Malay music more refreshing and more attractive to the younger generation. So um, yeah, that's my first part. And the second part of the question, I think it's, um, to be honest, I think it's really very difficult to attract young Singaporeans to become full-time cultural performing artists, especially that of the Malay culture, uh, Malay music. Um, um, I should say also that uh, most of the groups in Singapore, they are actually uh, not not all of them are full-time or uh, how to say full-time cultural uh, groups. Um, most of them, like my group as well, we are actually uh, kind of like a passion group. And the musicians, uh, do, they do have um, other jobs. Uh, some of them are still schooling. Some of them um, just started work, you see. So our activities take place in the weekends. For myself, I am a 
a full-time musician um, and I it to become a full-time musician in Singapore itself is very difficult. So you really need to find ways to kind of sustain yourself going into education. You have to really um, do a lot of things, performing arts. You have to perform, you have to, um, uh, what, what should I say, perform, educate, and, and things like that. It's, it's really difficult, to be honest. So the challenges, uh, this, these are the challenges that I'm facing myself. How do you attract people to come into the culture, to come into the, 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 the music? And um, I do what I can with what I've shared earlier, um, um, getting them on board through something that they've already familiar, they are already familiar with. Uh, yes, I think that's what I can share with these questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Shafika. Uh, we have another question which is actually directed to all the panelists, uh, but I'm going to invite uh, uh, Ms. Kupa Rajangam to start us off on the discussion. So the question is this, uh, if as the speakers have noted, the ICH is dynamic and fluid, what exactly are we safeguarding or seeking to preserve and, and how do we define what is traditional and, and what is authentic. So, so can I please request Ms. Rajangam to start off this discussion, please? Um, thank you, Professor Sinha. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a complex question. So. <laughs> okay, um, to start with, I mean, if you look at it at the level of the policy itself, so ICH was meant to be a counterpoint to uh, conservation of tangible heritage, right? Which is seen as something which is fixed at a particular location. Um, and it has these values that are like predetermined in some way. Uh, but the reality though is that, you know, we can't actually separate out the tangible and the intangible. So I see both these policies as coming together, uh, which is where I would question the category of traditional and authentic, right? Um, so authenticity is something we imagine. Um, it's not that it's a bad thing, right? All of us need some form of stability to hold on to, and which is what COVID has shown us over these last 18 months, right? We need something to give us permanence or something to root us, right? So cultural expressions, cultural forms are like an immediate good fit, you know, that sense of belonging, the sense of you know you've come from somewhere and you're going somewhere else, right? So all I would suggest is that we don't accept things at face value, right? If somebody says this is traditional and authentic, um, I would suggest asking that back to that person as to why, right? What moment in time define that as authenticity? What moment in time we find that as traditional, right? So then that will help us decide how to take it forward. Maybe 50 years ago, Ishwarapa stone carving, the authenticity was in recreating those traditional motives of the medieval period. But maybe 50 years later today, the authenticity of Ishwarapa stone carving is the fact that he's not using machines and he's still continuing to use tools that were handed down over generations to ensure the nuance is still there in the carving, right? So the form of the carving might not be traditional that way, but the process would be authentic, right? So these are kind of questions we would take at different points of time before we predetermine some category. Right. Thank you. I mean, it's a very complex question, but I guess the related question is, to whom does it matter, right? These categories of traditional and authentic. Um, is, does it matter to the artists? So I just just a point for discussion. But but you know, thank you for your your feedback. I wanted to invite Mr. Seng actually from Cambodia uh, to address the same question. Mr. Seng, we'd like to hear your uh, view on this. Mr. Seng, are you there? Yes, you hear me. Hi. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, thanks for uh, the question addressing to all the speakers. And this is really, really um, uh, like I think tricky question and the question no has no particular uh, answer to that to me. Um, so in terms of like the question that say, if ICH is dynamic or fluid, what exactly we are safeguarding or seeking to preserve? For that one, um, I think uh, it depends on the context. Um, 
especially uh, in in each country or in each region or in each uh, area in in that country even. So uh, to me, um, it depends on you know like because all the the ICH uh, has the same has its own value, uh, but we have to see. Uh, we, we, can, we have to see based on that context what kind of uh, uh, ICH that needs to uh, that, that can contribute the most uh, to that. Uh, this is uh, something that I have no uh, specific uh, answer to that, but uh, this is something I just want to suggest to do. And we also need to uh, um, think about like how. Uh, uh, apart from like the, the priority that uh, through its contribution uh, to the society, uh, we uh, also uh, need to see like uh, how. Uh, sorry, I forgot my 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 answer. But let, let me uh, uh, go move forward to the next question in terms of, and then maybe if I can remember, I will uh, come back to uh, to answer the first questions. Sure. So, thank you. Okay, so um, and then the next question, how to define traditional and uh, authentic. So to me, uh, traditional uh, refers to um, the trans I would say culture and something uh, or belief, you know? and in turn, that, that's just to me. And, and then uh, talking about authentic, um, authentic, uh, it, it, it depends on uh, how uh, you experience it, you know, like uh, the environment, for example, like sometimes when I tell you, oh, this is uh, authentic, uh, uh, then uh, you, but when you uh, go into that experience, you don't feel it is authentic, you know, but the other might, uh, might get the authentic experience. So it is, uh, so this definition would uh, refer to uh, um, uh, the, ex the exact experience, the direct experience that you guys have. Oh, now I, I remember one thing that uh, regarding to uh, uh, what exactly are we safeguarding. I think uh, to to this context right now is about the living arts. So the, the arts that are living uh, as a part of uh, daily life of the people, that is the important um, that uh, we... So once again, um, the living arts that part of the daily life and the living art that can contribute more to uh, the society where you are in. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, since this question is for everyone, I did want to invite Ms. Do and Ms. Uh, Shafika to add their views if they would like to. May I? Yes, please. Uh, I, I very agree with the ideas from Ms. Cooper and Ms. Song says. I just want to add a small things like uh, with our understanding, the traditional means uh, some things may change depending on the situation and generations. And uh, but for the authentic, this could not change, it's not change because it's the essential cultures and it's the matter for the value in each cultures. So that's why that this is our definition between traditional and authentic. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shafika, would you like to say something on this question? Yes, uh, I totally agree with what Ms. Do said and added, added on to that as well because I think that authenticity also has to do with um, how the music, I'm talking about my uh, art form in this sense, how, how the music kind of uh, relates to the, uh, the the other generations and we, we feel that essence, we feel that um, the, the, the living arts that were practiced before. So there's a need to to kind of preserve that essence, even though we are looking towards, um, you know, changing society, um, we are adapting to the changing society and uh, adapting our arts in that way, we still need to be able to preserve that authenticity so that um, it can be still uh, seen as something that is valuable, that that, it be, that is attached to the, the value of that culture and heritage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for responding to that not so uh, straightforward question. Uh, I'm going to take two questions now, which are actually directed at our keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Mount Shiva. And uh, both of these questions actually speak to the 
uh, availability of economic support for the arts and, and performing for crafts and performing arts. So let me read out uh, the, the two questions that have been then that have been asked. Right. So uh, the first question is, uh, you know, it takes time to let youth participate in the arts by income improvement for community development. What would be an effective entry point to activate youth? Um, and, and, the, and the second question, uh, also directed at Ms. Mochiba, is uh, selfish as we are wanting to preserve ICH but not providing the socioeconomic support to the community involved um, is, is problematic and how should we address this gap? Uh, so may I invite uh, Ms. Mochiba to uh, take us through those two questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor uh, Sinha for Vinita for the, uh, these questions. Now, um, <laughs> yes, improving income of a community is not an easy job and it takes time. It takes time and um, uh, when I observe any NGOs, you know, any entities who got successful examples, um, who got successful results, actually um, have worked at least for 10 years to create that results. And maybe at the end of 10 years, when there is a, a, some, um, when the fruit is coming, uh, this is when actually you start getting interested. So I, to be very honest, it, it's, there's no quick fix. And if one is not ready to engage with the same community for that long period of time and invest that much energy, um, I often say it's better not to start any community development projects because it's not very responsible. Now, um, having said this, um, now when um, we worked, uh, we started uh, with youth, the, um, we often tried to entice youth by using IT skills. The, um, that is also not for the ICH, but let's say for another projects uh, that UNESCO was dealing with on you know, how to kind of engage youth getting interested in conservation of the heritage monuments or the historical sites. Blah, blah, blah. And so we wanted to engage youth in doing the, uh, uh, the documentation of the heritage sites. Uh, now they are, they are not usually interested in documentation of heritage sites. They found it very boring. But instead we, we said, okay, we'll teach you how to make um, the uh, website. Uh, we teach you the, the IT skills, how to use the app and, and how to use some basic software to do the uh, website. This, suddenly the, the youth were interested. So the, so we used um, this uh, IT skills, uh, training on IT skills as an entry point. And that was also very much based on the experience of the another NGO I mentioned about, Digital Empowerment Foundation, who uses uh, IT skills as an entry point to address so many other things. So that was one way but um yes it's a difficult question it's uh <laughs> there's no quick fix uh when it comes to community development now um and, and of course this i see another related question is okay you, you want to safeguard ich but you don't want to be engaged in the community uh livelihood projects uh what do we do um of course not all the entities would be good at uh, community mobilization and livelihood support. And as I said earlier, it takes long period of time. If you are not committed to, uh, to provide, you know, uh, long term investment, uh, better not to, I, I, I better, you know, encourage not to start anything because you just create a, a hope which, uh, and then you disappoint them. But, um, and, but what I kind of encourage you is that you, uh, we can still work, uh, with other entities, I mean, we can offer our different expertise. Some might be good at documentation. Some might be just good at exhibitions, you know, uh, and do the social media promotions. You can partner with different entities. Because what I notice in the world of ICH is that um, uh, there are people working at their own level doing something very specific about ICH, but they don't collaborate together. So professor is just studying. But this study result is not uh, used for any purposes. And some um, entities are very good at doing the uh, craft sales, but they often don't have a, a strong academic knowledge about the um, about the, the craft tradition, so that their marketing skill is kind of very shallow because they don't have it. But then if they collaborated, maybe it could, you, know, uh, you can create a better result. So. Um, yeah, so my suggestion is that you can, yes, you can uh, try to support ICA with your own ways, but then uh, look at you know, partnering uh, with other entities to support each other. 
rather than try to just be the only champion, you know, uh, in this domain. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there's a question here for uh, all the panelists, actually, and I'm going to uh, flag it on the screen. So, you know, many millennials want freedom and flexibility uh, and also instant gratification at work, but becoming a master or expert of ICH takes very long. How can we address this mismatch of expectations? Uh, since this is addressed to all, I'll invite all, all uh, panelists to speak, and uh, I'd like to invite Ms. Krupa to, to start us off, please. Um, thank you, Professor Sinha. Um, yeah, so this, these are the kind of encounters I have very often in the field, and um, my particular focus is craft. Um, and this is where, like the previous question of the tradition, authenticity, um, freedom and flexibility to work sort of come together. Because what I have seen is maybe there is a tradition in the goldsmith, when I say traditional in the sense of the caste identity is connected with the craft that the person is practicing, is no longer interested. There is somebody from a different caste group who is personally interested in the kind of interest in the work involved, but there are these barriers which prevent that person from taking on this occupation or the trade or the craft which is associated with one particular caste, right? But the good thing is that working extensively in the field, I have seen that often the ones who are really keen figure out ways to overcome obstacles. So I have seen so-called, let's say, the traditional woodworking craft people who are no longer from the body cup of the traditional caste that is doing this. Um, they come from like the potter caste. Um, I have seen a goldsmith who was not interested and who has now gone into the folk performances, right? Because the way she or putting on of the costume and the persona was of more interest to him. But at a larger level, the difficulty is more about how do you do this across and it's not limited to individuals who are able to overcome these obstacles. And honestly, I don't have an answer to that because um, from my experience, what I've seen is um, uh, like Ms. Chiba was saying, it, it really takes a very, very long time and you get frustrated because you expect to see results in two, three years. Um, you have like your uh, peers who are maybe doing outsourcing work in IT and then they are getting returns much quicker and then they're able to buy new cell phones. So it, it's very difficult to balance this out. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Do, would you like to? Yes. Uh, Yes. Thank you. Yes. So, like the question already mentioned, to become a master or expert of ICH, it takes very long time. So, so I wonder, under the book of time, is now is the book of time right? Why we need to take a long time to become mastered? So, I I mean, if we can consider to promote under community development, because in community like our presentation mentioned, we have the seniors, we have the mature, and we have the youth. So the role of each generation is different. We can base on their strong point and can uh, identify and recognize with the understanding in their community so that they can together preserve their intangible culture. Rather than we need to take many time and long time to become expert and then start from that point. I think it's a little bit late to preserve the intangible cultures. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Singh, over to you. Thanks for the questions. To me, I think um, to me, I don't I don't see there is a gap at all. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of mismatch, I also don't see. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, like to become the master. Um, I think uh, that is just telling about the level that we want, and everything has the master, and all master level always takes time. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, you know, like it always uh, need the people to make their best efforts to reach out to uh, the master level. Uh, but in terms of, uh, I think, like uh, Ms. Du said, um, I think in terms of uh, joining and safeguarding ICH, it doesn't need to be that level. That level is for those who really uh, get more interested in, in learning more. So, uh, for example, like the youth program that we are working with, we 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 don't have uh, we we never expect that uh, like at least fifty of them, but fifty percent of them would become the master of the the, the skill that we're providing. 
but uh, I'm sure uh, some of them would become that, you know, but we don't know who and we don't know when they're going to become. But at the same time, uh, they, they can join actively to uh, safeguarding ICH. Uh, through like keep uh, telling about their friends about that and at least they know the community there uh, if they they want to uh, reach out to um, and if they want to help promote they know where and who to talk to I think that that should be uh, uh, enough uh, for this so that's my answer thank you. thank you thank you very much so there are still a couple of questions and we have probably less than 10 minutes so I'm going to take the general questions. And so this is a question to all panelists, and I think this is an important one, given the binary of tradition and modernity, uh, past and present and future that we deal with uh, and, and use when we are talking about youth. So uh, the question is this, can you speak about the influence of dominant popular mainstream cultural traditions in your respective contexts, for instance, Western classical music or, or Korean pop music? Uh, and I suppose the discussion could take uh, kind of a position about whether these influences exist and whether they've been, uh, you know, empowering or, or debilitating, right? So I'm going to again invite uh, Ms. Krupa to start us off. I'm just following the sequence of, of presentations that were made. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I did see this question as it popped up briefly and I was trying to sort of think back from my own experience. So again, I will be speaking from the perspective of crafts. Um, there is definitely the influence of um, what is typically called mainstream cultural traditions. Um, and it's, it's kind of a trade-off, right? So in some instances, um, the craftsperson, like let's take the stone carver, again, he might be trained in uh, carving, uh, let's say, chola kind of figurines or Vijayanagara period figurines. But that's not what sells. And then somebody comes and sees his studio and commissions him to do something, say, for the garden, right? So he's typically been working with like a functional purpose. And now he's asked to do something that is ornamental. So some of them resist uh, because they feel it is um, somehow dishonoring the tradition of the craft they have inherited. But there are others who welcome it because they see that they are able to balance these two worlds, right? So they also take on these popular commissions for putting these ornamental figurines in the garden. But at the same time, then they're able to then maybe make these idols for groups and for smaller shrines who may not otherwise be able to get those kind of idols from them. So it's it's kind of some choose to reject and some try to balance both worlds because we see the plus and minus both ways. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Doe? Yes. Mm. I agree that maybe there has some kind of influence to the cultural traditions. However, uh, under my thinking, we have uh, the Kutu people, or uh, first temple. They have their own folk songs, and the people here in their traditional cultures, like the traditional festival, they still use their own songs to dance, to sing, rather than just use the Korean or the Western classical music. So, I feel the roots, they are very flexible. How to use the modern uh, music with the traditional music, in, especially in their mainstream, so that they can, okay, balance between the modernized and the classical nice. Right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Shafika? Yes. I think that, you know, um, in Singapore, there are dominant popular mainstream um, uh, traditions uh, in, you know, in terms of pop music, uh, Korean pop music, and this, all these kinds of things, they attract the youth. And this is what the youth, you know, um, in any urban development, uh, urban countries, they are, they're listening to, I think, uh, in my perspective, I think this is what is dominant for them. And um, of course, I think for traditional cultures, it's more to us trying to use these influences to try and reach out to them. Um, it's it's still for me, um, in my perspective, I think I still think that majority of the traditional arts practitioners here are still trying to um, kind of uh, preserve what we've been doing before. But 
uh, in a, at, at the same time, it, it comes simultaneously. At the same time, we're also looking into ways into reaching out to the youth by having these influences into the music in, uh, in my in my art form context, in the context of traditional money music. This has been happening. We do see uh, compositions um, which uh, kind of like in a, in a way they are, they are ethnic pop genres. Um, uh, they try to use uh, modern sounds to um, appeal to the, the the listening conditions of um, the youth. Uh, but uh, in essence, I I still think that there's there's still um, kind of like um, that the, the the traditions are still being kept in place. Uh, this is just a way a, a way to kind of um, you know uh, to disseminate and uh, pro promote the music. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Singh. Okay. Thanks for the questions. Um, so in uh, uh, in Cambodia, I think uh, the influence uh, uh, really uh, happens uh, a lot, and it also helps. Uh, you know, Cambodian uh, artists uh, uh, work uh, work out and to adapt themselves um, into the, uh, such influence, but uh, they also still find their own ways to. Uh, to go together, so, you know, like um, the Western uh, uh, culture or tradition and the, the uh, and Cambodian tradition, how we we go together rather than just to. Uh, uh, I before before now, I think uh, many use they they really capture quickly uh, the the influence uh, like the, the Western culture and things like that. But right now, it seems like they are more open and they try to find uh, ways to uh, to go together. Um, even though still are some uh, uh, concern, for example, like the scale, the the Western music scale. Uh, now people try to adapt their musical instruments. Uh, according to the Western scale, like music notation, but uh, they and many of them now they uh, forget about uh, you know Cambodian traditional uh, music scale. So uh, something like that. But uh, but I still uh, I still find that uh, so far still okay, and we we put uh, committed to to go together. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I'm going to take a final question, and I think this is a good note on which to end this panel. And, uh, you know, all panelists have been asked this question, what is the intangibility of ICH? Uh, it pertains to the practice, but also meanings behind the practice itself. Uh, is this distinction defined enough in the ways we formally think about ICH today? So I think given the brief of this uh, work symposium of the next uh, today and tomorrow, right? This is a really relevant question, and and may I invite all panelists uh, to to respond to this as a as a final statement for today. Uh, so let's start with Ms. Krupa. Um, thank you. Yes, as you pointed out, this is definitely something worth thinking about. Um, personally, I would speak from my own experience, and I would say that I do not see the distinction between. The tangible and the intangible. To me, there is a holistic, holistic is a wrong word, it sounds romantic. <laughs> Let's say an integrated expression of heritage. And so it's both the product and the process coming together, and you cannot separate it out, right? So typically, with crafts in particular, it is seen as the craft product, the material, tangible expression is given more importance than the, let's say, the intangibility of the craft's person working or the skills or the songs they sing when they're doing a particular kind of uh, part of their process, right? So that's the first part of the question. Uh, considering the icy edge um, of UNESCO, I don't think the distinction is defined enough, right? Um, so that's probably more to do with uh, the history and the politics of what led to the Intangible Heritage Convention being framed and passed at the moment that it did. So maybe this question is a good opportunity for UNESCO to reflect back on, okay, it had to be done at that point of time, but there's enough time to reflect back on what is it that I see it is going forward. Right. Thank you. That's that's good ways forward. Uh, Ms. Doe? Yes, thank you, professors. So with me, the... Um, Intangibility in ICH today is mean conceptual value. So even if we cannot see this one, but we have the 
have the common value in communities and cultures. So with the Kachi people, for example, they call this the souls, this means something inside. So that one, even we could not touch, we can, we can, we can catch what it means the core value in the communities. So I believe that with this concept, um, meaning, so it's very meaningful for the next, yes, tomorrow day, we have the more discussion and it's had many meaningful for discussing about this ICH. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Tika? I think, um, yes, uh, I think that this distinction um, you know, in, in preserving ICH, uh, I think we also have to see that, uh, yeah, there's, there are meanings behind the practice that ha has to kind of like, um, you know, see through when we, we talk about ICH, like, um, like for, in my experience, uh, traditional Malay music, um, urban-based Malay folk music practice in Singapore, we do see it, we hear it, that's the tangible form of that uh the, the practice uh but the practice itself like going into for example how how are we looking into attracting the youth and how are we looking into um propagating the, the music like how how do we teach yeah which is uh, i think an, an area that that still needs to be worked on um for the urban based malay folk music uh, culture and scene in singapore uh this intangibility aspect um I, I think needs to, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it has to, we have to look into that sense as well, other than just it, you know, something that is visual. Um, I, I, this is my thoughts um, so far, yeah. Thank you, thanks, Mr. Shafika. And Mr. Sang, your thoughts on this question, please. Thanks. <clears throat> so um, we may clarify the question. So uh, the question is, I know that about intangibility of ICH, but uh, the last question confirmed about uh, intangibility refers to practice and some things behind that practice. Is that correct? Yes, I think the, the question is referring to, you know, the intangible of the intangible cultural heritage and whether that's in that's a meaningful category for us to look at heritage or not and, and whether the binary of tangible versus intangible is a tenable one or not. Mm. I, I, I think uh, to me, uh, use those distinction to cover, uh, sh you know, uh, we, we need something, maybe something to explain or to elaborate a bit more on that, so that it can, uh, uh, for me, I still feel not enough with just saying that, because then it, it's like uh, uh, mentioned about it, but uh, the listener or the people that we are trying to tell about that uh, would not know what exactly we, we are trying to tell them about, you know. So it is more than just practice. Uh, and and of course, it is correct that it is more than, and there's a lot more behind that. But I think what kind of behind that, for example, like you need to think about the environment, like, I mean, um, the atmosphere that, that it has to be, uh, it has to have those practices and also the living treasure and, and means the people who uh, who hold that uh, kind of ICH uh, knowledge. Uh, so how can we uh, we include uh, those people so that how, uh, we, uh, you know, like the people we are trying to tell them uh, can have more visualization about what we are going to, to explain them. So that, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Seng. So I, I think, you know, we are well beyond the time that, that we were given for the, for the Q&A, but I thought it was more important to ask the general questions addressed at all panelists. There were a couple of questions to a specific panelist that I didn't get to ask, uh, you know, asking my apologies for that. But uh, please join me in thanking all the panelists. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Vinita. So, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, before we leave, we'd like to request that you complete the feedback form via the pigeonhole platform and key in the passcode NHBICHCAP or scan the QR code on the screen here. Uh, with that, we have come to the end of day one of the 2021 Southeast Asian Collaborative Meeting on Safeguarding ICH. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our panelists and moderator today again. And most importantly, thank you all, our audience, for tuning in to today's webinar. Uh, please remember to join us again tomorrow for day two of the 2021 Southeast Asian Collaborative Meeting. Um, and the topic tomorrow will be the digital medium. So thank you again to everyone for joining us on the first day of the symposium. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you. Bye.